Christianity is supremely the champion of purity. I mean, Christianity is supremely the champion of purity. Those words written a generation ago by Professor William Barclay uh, really set in motion my understanding of how believers in Jesus Christ ought to think about sexual morality. Christianity is supremely the champion of purity. My question is, is that still true? Is that still true in a culture that throws off all restraint? Is that still true when we have a media that delights in degeneracy? And we are a media-driven, a media-saturated culture. Is that true with the prevalence of sexual intimacy in all kinds of relationships outside of marriage? Is it still true that Christianity is supremely the champion of purity? Is that that still true with the universal availability of pornography? Um, What we had to go after in our generation um, seeps in a thousand different ways in our sons and daughters' generation. Is it still true that Christianity is supremely the champion of purity. Uh, When pastors fall morally, when pastors and churches choose to bless uh, marriages, including homosexual marriages, that are not uh, biblical by any definition of that. Is it true that today the church of Jesus Christ is supremely the champion of purity? Uh, This, by the way, is not a new phenomenon. This was true in... New Testament times as well, Klein Snodgrass in his writing on Ephesians gives us a fairly lengthy and accurate view of what it was like when the Apostle Paul wrote this. Why, when we get to Ephesians 5, which is where we'll be today, why the Apostle Paul took as much time as he did to develop a clear understanding of how believers in Jesus Christ ought to relate on this issue of sexuality Sexual attitudes in the ancient world were similar to today's, although at times even more blatant. Often a double standard existed so that wives were expected to have sexual relations only with their husbands. Men, however, had various sexual outlets as long as they did not commit adultery against another man's marriage. Uh, Quoting uh, one of the ancient writers from this time, "'Mistresses we keep for the sake of pleasure.'" concubines for the daily care of our bodies. But wives bear us legitimate children to be faithful guardians of our households. Uh, One Roman writer at this time, a man named Cicero, wrote approvingly of the legitimacy and the antiquity of young men having affairs with other young men or women. Prostitution, homosexuality, bisexuality were common, and slaves often were abused sexually. The challenge became that those who had been redeemed out of that kind of a sexually saturated and charged environment were too easily, uh, too easily adopted the sexual attitudes of the culture around them. Sexual sin will not mesh with the life in Christ. What we do with our bodies matters because our bodies belong to God. With that as a backdrop, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to look through the first 21 verses of this chapter this morning, and here's the question we're going to need to wrestle with. How can you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, not survive in this culture? How can we thrive in this culture? And how can you and I walk in purity in such a way that it is inviting for those who do not understand our approach to human sexuality or the Bible's approach to understanding what it's like to be in a marriage relationship. First, uh, the first verse, Ephesians chapter 5, and verses 1 and 2, the first two verses, really introduce this entire section. Therefore, well, therefore what? Well, look at the last verse of chapter 4. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. As someone forgiven by God through Christ's work, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, look at verse 2, and walk in love. We have been saved by grace so that we may then 
walk in love. It's interesting that this long section, it's one of the longest sections in the New Testament dealing with how families relate to one another and how believers ought to relate to this issue of sexuality. It's one of the longest sections, and it's introduced by saying, walk in love. Because so often the world has a very mixed up concept of love. Uh, Confusing love and lust, or love with indulgence. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave uh, gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Here's what Ephesians is going to teach. and I, I feel like to some degree I've been saying the same thing every week for the past three weeks. Hopefully, I've been saying the same thing every week for the last nine weeks since this is our ninth message in the book of Ephesians, but it's simply this. Let me drive it home for us. My identity drives my choices, child of God. My identity as a beloved child of God experiencing the forgiveness of God for my past drives my moral choice to walk in purity. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5 goes on, verses uh, 3 through 6, lay out what it is the expectations are. And what's going to be really clear is this is for believers. Twice he's going to say, it is or is not proper. Meaning it is or is not appropriate for those who have received forgiveness in Christ, who follow Christ as their Savior to operate or to live this way. So uh, verse 3. But, live a life of love, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, here it is, as is proper among saints. Now when he says it shouldn't be named among you, he doesn't mean don't ever talk about it. Obviously, he's writing about it at this very moment. He's saying it should not be understood among the world around us or even within the church that these kinds of things would describe, would be named about those who uh, follow Christ. So uh, sexual immorality, very simple word. It means any kind of sexual contact outside of the marriage bed, the marriage relationship. The original word has to do, the English word would be pornography or porn actually, and it just has the idea of illicit sexual contact. A relationship outside what God intended for that. So that that should not be. And impurity is is just sort of a general description for the kind of sexuality that is not acceptable. It's not a pure, uh, good kind of sexuality. Or covetousness. And some would say, well now, why would envy or covetousness uh, be listed along with these sexual sins? The idea is coveting another person's body. The idea is wanting something that's not for me to have. And so I act out on that, and there's sins of the heart, the sins of the mind, covetousness related to sins of the body, which is sexual impurity, uh, sexual immorality. It's not proper. Uh, This is the argument. Uh, Our choices are driven by our identity. And as forgiven, loved children of God, uh, we are not to be uh, pursuing these things. Look at verse 4. It's not just our body, he's going to name how we use our body, but also our mouths. How do we use our language? Uh, There also, verse 4, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. Uh, A simple idea of just uh, don't talk with double entendre. Now, one writer said, uh, this speaks of those who have a filthy mind and it's expressed in their filthy mouth. Uh, Not just locker room talk, but the kind of cubicle talk that can find in any statement something a little dirty or off color that uh, they laugh about. And they're always always turning any kind of conversation toward these kinds of things. This should not be named among us, uh, which are, look at the end of verse 4, these are out of place. It's interesting that using our bodies sexually in a way that is not, uh, in following God, is not proper. Uh, It shouldn't be something believers do. And using our language in such a way that is sexually charged or dirty or those double entendres, that's not decent. That's not proper either. It's just not fitting. In fact, look at his prescription for solution of this. Instead, the end of verse 4, instead, let there be, what is it? Isn't that something? The, The cure... The cure for a filthy mouth or a filthy mind or or acting out sexually, the cure is thanksgiving. Well, now how's that the cure? 
we're thankful for what God has given us. We're thankful for the way God has provided for us. And we need to be good theologians here because the, the thought might be, well, Scott, you're talking a lot about don't do, don't do, don't do. So therefore, my understanding would be God's desire is that we not express ourselves sexually. That, by the way, is not true. Remember, it was God's idea that reproduction should happen sexually. We could be like some plants and reproduce asexually. That would make for a very boring marriage, right? God has provided this. In fact, I would argue this, and I think the Bible bears this out. Cultures like ours has become, over the last 40 or 50 years, devalue sexual intimacy. We devalue sexual intimacy because we make it so common, so so blah. Where the Bible understanding of sexuality is that it's so precious, it's such an intimate part of our lives, not just our bodies but our souls, that God puts very high boundaries and barriers saying, protect this. So I've got my old beat up blue jeans that I wear when I'm mowing the yard. If the ground ever thaws, I'll mow the yard. Um, But I don't wear that here on Sunday mornings. I, I count it a privilege to preach and to teach and to, to talk to you, and so I wear something a little bit nicer at least. And so same way, in, in one sense, the way we use our bodies. If we're just using our bodies uh, with whomever we're in the current relationship with, it devalues the body. It devalues what God has set as a high priority, a high value, moral purity. Whereas those who choose to be married, those who choose to stay loyal within that marriage, Uh, They choose to highly value uh, sexuality. And this is what he's saying. For believers, my identity drives my choices. And here it is. I choose to walk in purity. The child of God, here's the choice for us. I choose to walk in purity. Now, let's talk about that. Some would argue, listen, Scott, a hundred years ago, people were all repressed about sex. Well, that may or may not be true. I didn't live a hundred years ago, okay? But I can tell you this, in this generation, we obsess about sex. It's as though the greatest thing in life is to have the greatest sexual experience, let alone what all the rest of our life is about. And it it lays out or it holds forth a standard that cannot be met. And when we bring that sense, we buy into that marketing in our relationships, especially in our marriage, the challenge or the danger is we think, you know, if I'm not having this kind of an aha moment here, like the uh, Budweiser commercial says, or the Audi commercial says, or, or shampoo commercials, whatever they use sex to sell, maybe, uh, maybe I can find it out there somewhere. And uh, marriages are shipwrecked. Uh, husbands or wives are, are deeply hurt because someone chose not to walk in purity. My identity drives my cho- choices. I choose to walk in purity. In the uh, 50s, let's talk about church. In the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, 70s at least when I was growing up, uh, the, the criticism of conservative, evangelical, Bible preaching and teaching churches was this. They have a list of don'ts. And they are legalists. Have you ever heard that? They're legalistic. You ever heard of that? Have you heard that criticism of my generation? A few of you that are my generation have heard that. And uh, some of us actually rebelled against that. And uh, the problem, my concern, is that over the last 20 years, that pendulum has swung so far the other way that now evangelical churches are libertine. They have license. There is no sense of moral standard. So that you have a whole generation, especially of young people, that have the right doctrine and terrible or no idea of practice. This is how uh, issues like uh, living together outside of marriage, sexual activity outside of marriage, a homosexual marriage or homosexual relationships can be so muddied up and people from a, a, a gospel preaching evangelical church can say, well, I need to be for those things. Or at the very least, I shouldn't be against those things. Please hear what the Scriptures say. Verse 3 says, These kinds of things should not even be named among believers. It is time that the church of Jesus Christ, with great gentleness but great clarity, declare these things are right, these things are wrong. 
And we're doing that not on our own authority, but rather because God, who created human beings, has laid out parameters or guard, uh, guardrails that has said, this is good, this is healthy, this causes great damage and heartache, don't cross that boundary. Believers in Jesus Christ choose to walk in purity. Look, in fact, a little further down in chapter 5 because he's pretty pointed about the way he wraps this section up. He says, child of God, as someone who is beloved, as someone who has been forgiven, don't let immorality or filthiness or covetousness even be named among you. Don't use your body. Don't use your mouth in a way that's inappropriate for the the name you bear, Christian, follower of God. And then just to make sure he has our attention, um, verse 5. For you may be sure of this. It's, It's a solemn way of saying what he is about to tell us means something. It counts. You may be sure of this. Everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, he lists those same three uh, sins that are not to be named among believers. That is an idolater. That is, you've placed something above your loyalty to God, in this case, sensual pleasure, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Very serious warning. You remember back in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8? You who were far off have brought near. You who are dead or alive. Chapter 1 talks about how we're predestined, we're chosen by God, that we should be what? Holy and blameless in Him. And we have an inheritance with the saints, with the holy ones. What he's saying is those who live a lifestyle reflected by those kinds of sins that have been mentioned are in danger of forfeiting an inheritance. Not that we have our salvation and lose it, but rather that by our lives we're demonstrating we don't have it. Because someone who has that inheritance doesn't flaunt it or squander it in that way. Look at verse 6. Yeah, well, Scott, come on, that's what you say. Look at verse 6. Almost as though the Apostle Paul anticipated objections. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. And what he's doing here, very, clear, uh, very clearly saying, there are those who live as children of disobedience. Uh, God says, but they disobey that. Those people are described as unbelievers. That's what he's saying. There are those who are in the camp, in the family, they're sons of those who disobey. It's exactly what he's saying earlier in chapter 2 and chapter 3. For those who are believers, we have been taken out of that group. We've been brought into a new group. Why would we live as though we're going back that way? That, that's the concept. That's the thought. I choose to walk in purity, which makes two points we need to, to wrestle with. In our culture, saturated with sexuality through every delivery vehicle possible, here's what believers need to understand. Our moral choices reveal our hearts. Okay, my identity drives my behavior. When I make a choice to live out an immoral lifestyle, I am revealing something about my heart. Now Paul would argue here, we are living like we're still sons or daughters of disobedience. That's why he says it's not appropriate. Because we are not that kind of person, therefore we should not be living like we are. Second observation about this issue, not only do our moral choices reveal our hearts, but our moral choices bring consequences. Our moral choices bring consequences. When I choose to live in disobedience to the standards that God has laid out for our good, uh, I invite God's, uh, the word Paul uses here is wrath. It's a, it's a hard, cold word about God who has a settled disposition against this kind of behavior. Uh, look at uh, Matthew chapter 12. I just want to drive this home. Matthew chapter 12. Yeah, well, what about Jesus? I mean, you know, Jesus, Paul sounds kind of harsh. How about Jesus? Look at Matthew 12. I want us to wrestle with this. I, I think that uh, because of the prevailing culture of the day, Uh, Churches have become a little fearful to speak truth. And I wanted to do that uh, gently, 
I want to do that respectfully, but I think we need to be pretty bold about this. I, I, think, I think we do a disservice to our children if they don't hear a clear word saying, thus says the Lord, this is for your good. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 33 the context is a confrontation Jesus had with religious leaders who were using their words in very um, unhelpful ways. Jesus in Matthew 12, 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. Now addressing those religious leaders who were hypocrites, you brood of snakes. It's kind of snake as a viper. How can you speak good When you are evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This goes to that issue of how we use our mouth as believers. Now look at verse 35. The good person out of the good, I'm sorry, the good person out of his good treasure, meaning in your heart, brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. Talk about that accountability, wrath. Look at what Jesus said, verse 36. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Does that give anyone else pause? I speak a lot. (laughs) This is one of those verses that makes me very, very nervous. It's one of those verses that requires me constantly to go before the Lord and say, oh, forgive me for that one. Um, All right, Uh, I I tell you that. Look at verse uh, 37. For by your words you will be justified. By your words you will be condemned. One one of the basis for our judgment when we have uh, that time of accounting before the Lord is how did we use our words and how closely did our words uh, reflect our heart. Look at Matthew 15. It's interesting, again, in the context of Religious leaders who were saying one thing and doing another. Matthew chapter 15, look at verse 10. Here's here's what I'm driving at. Scott, why are you taking so much time with these biblical cross-references? I'm driving at this. I'm trying to illustrate this. Our identity drives our behavior. Who we are dictates our moral choices. And so therefore the scripture would teach, change who we are, Change the heart, and the moral moral choices change. Look at verse 10. Uh, Jesus here uh, wants to make a point. He called the the people to him, and he said, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. It's not what you eat, it's what you say. The disciples came to him and said, "Uh, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Hey, you made some people mad. Right, you're making the connection. Thank you. Verse 13. He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father is not planted will be rooted up. Some people are just going to get tossed aside because of the frustration they have. Let them alone. They're blind guides. They don't understand. Following that kind of teaching takes you to the ditch because that's where blind guides lead you. The blind lead the blind will both not fall into a pit. Now look at verse 15. Peter, speaking for the disciples, like, uh, what do you mean? Uh, explain this to us. Verse 16. He said, are you still without understanding? You don't get it yet? Look at uh, verse 17. Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach as it expelled into the latrine? That's the literal translation. You're just talking about the biology. What goes in simply is processed and comes back out. But look at verse 18. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defiles a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a person. Back in Ephesians chapter uh, 5. Our moral choices reflect our hearts. And our moral choices bring consequences. Here is the place of conflict with our culture. Here, child of God, is where you and I need to be not only smart, Wise as a serpent, but gentle or harmless as a dove. Here's the conflict. Our culture has taught for at least a generation now, there is no moral standard. 
Okay, that's a great place to agree by saying. Okay, 25 years ago, my last year of, of college, in a philosophy 400 level class, I was called upon, uh, there were several choices to make, to write an article uh, with this topic. Is homosexuality uh, morally right or wrong? And I, I submitted a paper where I said it is morally wrong based on my understanding of what the Scripture teaches. And I got a very severe critique back saying, you cannot judge it based on what the Bible says. Make your argument from culture, from biology, from practice. I responded to this professor, I cannot make that argument. I can't make that argument. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, those in our culture who battle saying, you know, uh, the homosexual lifestyle leads to this or immorality leads to that, and they talk about collateral damage. By the way, that's all true. But that's not the reason why we would be against those kinds of behaviors. The reason why children of God are against those kinds of behaviors is because our Father has created us and said, don't do this. And we will lose 100% of the time the battle for culture if we argue on the foundation of practicality. Or if we argue on the, the foundation of a philosophy, we will lose 100% of the time. Because 40 years ago, psychological culture said this was wrong. In fact, it was, it was listed in the, uh, in the catalog of psychological illnesses, um, some sexual practices. Today, we will soon be classified as uh, mentally unbalanced for standing morally right or wrong. So don't make your argument on practical things. Stand on this. My Father, who loves me, created me, and wants to redeem the entire world, has said these are unacceptable behaviors because of the destruction they bring in life. These are acceptable behaviors. I will stand on that. The culture has said there are no moral standards other than whatever the, the culture dictates. And secondly, there are no moral consequences. And we don't have time to go through this much more, but uh, just simply a lot of culture is about how do I ameliorate or remove the consequences of uh, immoral actions. And uh, we uh, uh, do not go to a good place when culture sets uh, that standard. All right, um, question then becomes this. Scott, if, if God has set out for our good that purity, moral purity, is the standard, and that Christianity ought to be supremely the champion of moral purity, then how do I relate to the culture around me? How do I, how do I handle not only how I live my life, but how I interact with people at work, at school, in the neighborhood, at the gym? And there are at least uh, two options which are wrong options, but which the church historically has chosen. This generation, especially youngsters, have chosen the path of accommodate. Accommodate means just fit in. Let's really re-examine, and maybe the moral standards of my parents are just wrong because they were culturally bound. And what that generation, or what this generation, our young generation, is going to figure out in time, if they're serious students of the Bible, is that mom and dad got a lot of things wrong, but when it came to those big moral categories, we stood as they will need to stand on the teaching of the Word of God. So, so some choose to accommodate. I will simply fit in. What is very important to me is that I be thought of as sophisticated or fitting in. A second option, and this is something that fewer choose, certainly my generation, uh, though many chose this, which is not accommodate, but isolate, just check out. I'm not going to fit in, I'm going to check out. I'm going to send my kids either only to homeschool or only to Christian schools or only to Christian colleges or only to Christian clubs or only to Christian whatever, and I will never in, uh, integrate with the culture. I'm going to isolate totally. Okay, The monks tried this centuries ago. It does not work. The problem is you bring the worst sinner you know into the isolation chamber with you because <laughs> you are the worst sinner you know, and so am I. And so uh, accommodation doesn't work. Isolation doesn't work. We're not called to stand there, point our fingers, and yell at people who are different than us. Well, what do we do then, Scott? If we can't accommodate and we can't isolate, what do we do? How about what the Apostle Paul writes for us? Illuminate. Shine the light. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to read 7 through 14. The biblical approach to how to relate to a, a culture that is saturated, it's saturated with immorality, is to illuminate that. Look at verse 7. 
Um, he, he's going to give us a do not, and then he's going to give us a do. And so here's the do not. Therefore, verse 7, therefore, because God's wrath comes upon them, because we are beloved children of God, therefore, do not become partners with them. Okay, he doesn't mean partner in the technical sense of a business partner. But partaker is a great word. Uh, f- fellow sharers might be the, the most accurate kind of way to translate that. Don't, don't join them doing the exact same things. That's, that's the idea. A child of God, because of your calling to holiness, because of your forgiveness, salvation, grace of God, Walk in love, and that means not being a fellow sharer, not being a partaker of these kinds of things. And look at the argument, verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. I love that. Who we are, redeemed by the light of the world informs how we act, live, walk as children of light. And then verse 9, for the fruit of light, if we're walking in light, what will that produce in our life? The fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So our lives should look like good and right and true. And here's the, so the do not is do not become a sharer, a partner, uh, here's the verse 10 is the do, and try to discern what is pleasing for the Lord. I love the balance here. I think it's a helpful way to understand it. What the Lord is saying is don't partner with those who are uh, immoral. In other words, don't plunge into that. First Peter 4 says, don't plunge into the same flood of partying. Rather, here's the alternative, please the Lord. Okay, again, the motivation for holy living is not keep a list of don'ts. The motivation for holy living is do what pleases the Lord. So as I work through in my life, what are the right choices or the wrong choices, I'm not going to partake, I'm not going to be a partner, but I am going to please. This is very practical. Listen, this, this is very practical. What, uh, what basis, what standard do I use for what movies I'm going to see? Come on, Scott. I mean, that's so petty. Does it make me a further partaker? I mean, I'm just saying. I'm not saying don't say. I don't. I'm not saying uh, don't see movies. Uh, Vicky and I love to go out to dinner and a movie occasionally. I am saying think. Is this apt to make me a a partaker, a partner, or is this something that's pleasing to the Lord? I think there are terrific movies. I think there's you know, great to be moved by a well told story that's well acted. But I think Christians are. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and say it. Foolish, foolish, if we don't have discernment and try and figure out what pleases the Lord. There are some things I do not need to see. Men, there are some things you don't need to see either. Try that again. I'm not sure you're buying. Men, young men, old men, Fairly young men like me. <laughs> there are some things we simply don't need to see on screen. Ladies, some things you don't need to see on screen either. There are some conversations we just don't need to be a part of. There's some language we simply don't have to, by choice, expose ourselves to at $10 or $12 a pop. And it's not just movies. What, what choices do we make about our television? Television today is where movies were uh, 15, 20 years ago. And if you're going to spend $70 a month on your cable bill, or $170, I don't know what it costs these days, but if you're going to spend that, we might want to be discerning about what we're bringing into the home or allowing our kids to have control of the remote. Prudent. What is pleasing to the Lord? It's, I'm not saying uh, don't have any fun. I am all for fun. I'm a big guy. I'm a big fun guy. I'm saying, let's redefine fun uh, to what is uh, pleasing to the Lord. Uh, What do we read? Uh, To what are we exposing ourselves? Um, Those are big questions that reflect our heart. Okay, let's not isolate. Let's not accommodate. Let's uh, illuminate. Well, where's that coming from, Scott? Look a little further down. Uh, You are light in the Lord. Live as the children of light. And look at um, discern what's pleasing to the Lord. Look at verses 11 and 12. 
Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. So don't, don't be partners, rather expose them. And let's be clear on this. It is shameful to speak of the things that they do in secret, all right? What does it mean to expose them? Does this mean that we should carry a big sign and say that, uh, you know, Warner Brothers or MGM, uh, they're terrible? Well, no, I, that doesn't what it mean. That's not what it means. So should we start posting on Facebook what other Christians are doing wrong in our perception? Well, of course, that's not what it means to expose them. Uh, in fact, I think we have a picture. You know who Fred Phelps was? Fred Phelps uh, died. He was the uh, bitter, angry, unbiblical preacher out in Kansas who used to go to funerals of soldiers or homosexuals and uh, picket. And he is a joke, was a joke. Uh, he gave a black eye to Christians. Uh, this is not what it means to expose. In fact, let's let the Bible, can we just let the Bible explain it? Would that be a good plan, you think? So let's let the Bible explain it. What does it mean when it says we should expose the unfruitful works of darkness? Look at verse 12, I'm sorry, um, 13 through 14. Okay, let me just say this, right? It's like, it's already 10.04. I'm not going to get to my third point, so don't worry about it. Um, this is important. Can we let the Scriptures teach us? I mean, we're going to save ourselves a lot of foolish things we're going to say, read, or give our money to if we'll just let the Scriptures teach, okay? Especially in these kinds of touchy subjects like morality, sexuality, where Christians can be so foolish in the way they approach it. Let's, let's be biblical. That's a much better plan. Uh, all right, so that, that was for free, not in my notes, but, you know, sometimes you just got to say it, right? Okay, good, all right. If, I'm gonna feel, if you don't, I'm going to feel better today, okay? All right, um, all right when, verse 13, when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Okay, what we're talking about, listen, looks at the analogy, he says, you once were darkness, but now you're what? Okay, that's the goal for those we expose. It's not exposed to shame them. It's helped them go from darkness to light as well. Yeah, prove it. Okay, well, look at verse 14. Anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, and here he's quoting from Isaiah 60, verse 1, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead. Christ will shine upon you. That's the goal. That those who are walking in darkness, committing uh, the unfruitful works of darkness, would by just looking at our lives where we choose to walk in the light, would then be exposed to that and say, wow, that is a good way to live. And the ultimate goal is not condemnation, but salvation. Those who, who choose those lifestyles will find themselves broken and at an end. That's how God created the world. It works that way. And children of God, we are called to live holy lives and say holy words so that it is so attractive to live in the light that those lost people in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, and in our jobs, they say, I want to be in the light like that. It is not our job to condemn or judge. God does a much better job of that than I do. It is my job to walk and speak in the light as an attractive way, as an invitation to those who um, would see that. Now, I'm, I'm going to just dispose of the third point because we don't have time to, to treat it. We'll handle a little bit of that uh, next week, and it has to do with how I choose to walk in wisdom, but we'll cover that. Let me just close with this story. Uh, I have the privilege, I love doing this, of, uh, of marrying a lot of people. Uh, not that I'm a polygamist, I just you know, do the marriage ceremony for lots of people. Since I'm preaching about moral morality, let's clarify that. And so I'm marrying about eight people this summer. And it uh, reminds me of years ago, I met a wonderful, wonderful young couple. And they came to see me and uh, wanted to know would I marry them. And I asked them some questions. And they said that among the things they told me, they were living together. And I said, well, then I won't marry you unless we make some changes. And they're like, whoa, you know, wh Why? And so we talked about some biblical standards and why it's good that God sets these standards. And I just never forget what they said. It's just so clarifying for me as a younger pastor, many years ago now. They said, huh, we have never heard that before. I thought, this is job security for the preacher, right? <laughs> and, and, and I think we have an entire generation of people that have never heard before that God has set standards that are for our good. Um, I'll, I'll report to you that both of them trusted Christ. They, uh, he moved out. Both of them trusted Christ. I did marry them later, and they are still walking with Christ as far as I know today. That's the goal. 
And not to humiliate, not to judge. The goal is to see them redeemed by the power of Christ. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, some sermons are really easy to preach. Others are more challenging. Thank you for your grace. Lord, I know there's just so much more I could say, but um, I want to be faithful to your word and respect the time of our folks. Lord, uh, I felt like I spent a lot of time diagnosing and not as much time prescribing the cure. So, Father, I want to pray for those who are here heavy-hearted. Some have been um, hurt deeply, personally, by those near to them who have crossed these kinds of boundaries. And, uh, Lord, I pray your grace would be sufficient for them. Father, I pray that they would find the strength and the courage to forgive, not because people deserve it, but because you have forgiven them. And, uh, Lord, I pray in the process of time, that the trust and healing would be restored. Father, I pray for our young people. Father, at times I was a little direct with them today, but I trust them enough to take it. And I pray that you would raise up a generation of men and women who are very, very smart, very, very committed to understanding and living your word. God, that they would be a light to their generation that is hopelessly lost and befuddled. Lord, there are some here who will deeply wrestle with homosexuality. Lord, identifying that with who they are. Father, I pray that you would help them to find a great sense of forgiveness and cleansing and power in Jesus Christ. Lord, that the identity of male or female with which you created them would be embraced. Father, that they would not in any way sense that we are condemnatory, but rather we are a light welcoming them, urging them to live a life of love. Father, for others who have um, wrestled deeply with things like pornography, immorality, singles who just can't seem to walk a straight line morally, God, that we would live our identity For those who have crossed those lines, that there would be a frank, honest confession, a repentance, and a walking in sexual purity that you have called us to. God, I pray for our college students who are living in a sewer of moral relativity, that you would grant them tremendous self-control, restraint. Lord, that the believers on Christian college campuses, believers on uh, state college campuses, believers on private college campuses would band together and help hold one another to this standard of accountability, joy, that they would have the, the, the privilege, the power of walking in the light. And Father, I pray our church would never, ever forget we are called to call people out of darkness into light that with love, honesty, humility and respect, we would proclaim the great news of Jesus Christ crucified and risen again, and that all who would believe that would find forgiveness, restoration, and power to walk in the light. I pray that's the case. We ask this in Jesus' strong name. Amen.